Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com and follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell for our weekly videos. Every week, we interview film professionals to discuss their work, and this is made possible by our sponsors, OWC. For more information on how they can assist you in your filmmaking needs, go to owcdigital.com. Now, this week, I'm joined by editor Jennifer Barbutt, uh, whose work includes Man in the High Castle, Raised by Wolves, Jessica Jones, and so much more. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, we, we were chatting a bit before this, but you you said in your bio that you want to edit a Spanish film. Why? What is it, or a, a Spanish-speaking film, what is it about that that, you, that is attracting you? Gosh, I mean, that would be a, that would be a dream come true if anybody's, uh, anybody knows of one. I would love that. Um, yeah, my family is Cuban and we speak Spanish at home and I'm a Cuban-American. I was born, I'm first generation here. Uh, and yeah, I'm really tied to the culture. I'm really tied to the language. I speak Spanish with my children. Um, I, you know, I read in Spanish. I try to watch movies in Spanish. I, you know, everything. So it would mean, it would mean the world to me to see the nuances of actors' performances and to uh, work with a Spanish-speaking director, you know, a, a, just a Spanish-speaking crew, the whole, the whole sort of project. It would just mean, it would mean the world to me. It would be such a challenge. Now, have you, um, you've gone back to Cuba a few times. Have you looked into their film industry and seen what their, their film directors are like? I actually have not. And, you know, I was looking... Now that there's, um, there's opportunities being given to a lot more people that didn't have opportunities, I just actually worked with a Mexican director uh, in the beginning of the year. I worked with actually two Mexican directors and um, I, you know, I've never worked with any Latin directors at all. And so it was really, it's, uh, I have not actually looked into their film program, but I can see that there's more people coming out. And so to make those, you know, to network and to make those connections is really exciting. Now, you, I have to ask you about Jessica Jones. Yeah. <laughs> the first season is has like this crazy, I guess, bad character that she's got to overcome who can control her, uh, mm -hmm. her mentally and everything. And sort of like that fear of losing control of your, your body. How did you guys as a team, you know, you, the, the showrunners and what have you, uh, work together to make the second season more intense? Gosh, you know, I mean, our our showrunner, Mel, Melissa Rosenberg, she's she's incredible. She's incredibly talented and she's an incredible writer. And so I know that she she took time between the seasons to really think about how to build on that character, how to build on Jessica and to not just make it, you know, an extension of what it was for first season. So I know there was a lot of discussion about that. And she's also very particular about how it's shot. And so she likes a lot of, um, she liked a lot of like foreground in the shots. So the shots felt like could feel claustrophobic or interesting with a lot of like depth of field. So she was very particular into the, the feeling and the mood of it. And then casting for her mother, I mean, it was very important. And so it just, she was, she was, I would say it was like Melissa hardcore for, uh, you know, over the summer in between the breaks. And then when we went into production, there was obviously, you know, conversation after conversation after conversation of where would Jessica be at this point? How, you know, how is she reacting? Is she reacting the way her character would be? Is her character growing? What is her character doing? So it was very, it was very interesting. Now, a lot of that tension comes from your editing though, right? Like the, the content's there, but you need to uh, make the material work for us. So for how sure. Did you, how did you approach that uh, to make the because it was such a that was the thing that impressed me was that they you guys upped it for the next season oh, that's so great that's and, so great yeah um yeah i mean it really you know yes definitely with the editing and definitely with the directors um melissa hired all female directors for season two mm -hmm. and kristen Butters, of course is, is an amazing actress so between i think those kind of departments with editorial like it just, all the pieces worked very well together. And so it let, I think it let the editors do their job even better 
because all of those pieces were working. And it's so great because when you have really, really good actors, you can, you can hang on them and their face is, is interesting. It's doing something, it's alive, right? You can see like something happening in their eyes. And so it, it lets you hang on the shot. And so, and that's what I, I really like about editing. I think is, is exactly what you're talking about. It's like the tension of how long can you stretch out time, you know, until it feels fake, until you lose the audience. So I'm always trying to like kind of push the limit on that. Like how long can I stay before you've, you've overstayed your welcome, right? And then sometimes it requires, like if it's an action sequence and she's, you know, beating somebody up, it just requires her to be like really badass, right? So it just requires her to be like fast, 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 fast. She's super tough. But then when she's hurt and she's having a, a private moment that I call like a private moment, when we see her, you know, mm -hmm. paying the price for something, then it's, the, it's how long we can stay on that shot and how long to not, to not get in the way of it, mm -hmm. I think is, is an important key. Now, how do you like to approach scenes when you get your footage in? Is there, uh, do you stick to what the, the director sort of laid out or do you go choose your own shots? How do you like to approach your cuts? You know, I, I always watch all the dailies. Like my favorite thing to do is to get a cup of coffee and yogurt and to sit down and watch dailies. It's like my, one of my favorite things to do in, in life. Um, and, uh, and so I just watch, I watch all the dailies and I try when I watch all the dailies to just, I've, okay, so I'll read the scene. Obviously I've read the script first, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'll reread the scene and then I'll watch all the dailies. And I build like a chem reel. So it's like all the, the takes. And um, I try to be not non-judgmental when I watch the dailies. I try to just watch the dailies, like experience them like an audience member, right? And see if when I watch each shot, where in the take is it alive? Where does it feel special or like it's working, right? And also like, okay, well, the director meant, she means that for this part or that for this part, you know? And so kind of watching like where where it's happening. And then also seeing how, if they do multiple takes, how the takes change, right? Perhaps the blocking changed if it's a new master or um, the director gave a note performance wise or whatever, it was a prop change or something. So all those things are kind of, you know, lighting change, all those things are kind of interesting. So I just watch all the dailies. And then after I watch the dailies, then I just start, I start cutting and sometimes I'll start, it's weird. Sometimes I'll start at the beginning and sometimes I'll start in the middle. It just depends on like what, you know, it kind of depends on what the scene is or what the mood is. If it's um, if it's an action scene and it's like a lot of very short pieces, I might build the action part first and then the, the happening around it afterwards. But I kind of do like a very rough pass first. And so if anybody saw, and then I put it away. So if anybody saw this rough pass, they would be like, oh my God, this is a disaster. Right. It's, but it's a rough pass for me just to kind of get it out of my brain and in some sort of form. Um, because I feel like I'm, I'm best when, when I see something that isn't working. So I almost cut it in a way like where it's sloppy and like it doesn't work. And then I'm, I'm like, oh, obviously it needs to be this, 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 and this. And then I just take a pass after like a day or two later, I take a pass in it and then I fix it. And then, you know, and then it's all working, if that, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes complete sense. <laughs> it's I, kind of a weird way. Well, no, I was, I was going to ask, because you said you like to sit and watch the rushes. So is there a performance that you were like, damn, I was lucky to see this first? <laughs> like, I think about any time I've gotten to watch rushes, sometimes they, they do different takes, they do different tries on things. And sometimes it just, like you said, there's that magic moment where you're like, whoa. Right. Wow, that's a good question. Okay, so let me think. If there's a performance that I saw that I really, like just in general. Yeah, well, I've I mean, seen... you've worked on so many great, like I think about Ugly Betty or- um, Shush, America Park, like, incredible, yeah. They're yeah, all great well, I was gonna say, show. like, I remember watching her on that and then seeing her on, I can't remember what, there was like a movie or something that she appeared in. And I was like, whoa, like she's completely different. She's got this frame, right. she's really amazing. Right, the traveling pants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's like incredible. She's she's really, really talented. Um, the whole cast is talented on that show. It's like they're, they were really, really great. Um, let me think if there's a performance. I'm sure there is. You know, you know who I thought was incredible? This is just one, I mean, 
there's so, I've worked with like so many great actors. This is one that comes to the top of my head. Is her name is Chella Horsdale, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. She was the wife in Man in the High Castle. Okay. And she's an incredible actor. Like she's she's so talented. And there's this part where she's watching. Um, it's in season four, and she's watching like a the a video, and she sees herself. She's watching like the old film reel camera, and she's, she sees herself in the United States times with her son who's alive and her husband who's happy and he's not like this hardcore Nazi, you know? And so she sees the, the American win version of herself. Mm -hmm. And she's so incredible in that moment. And I remember watching the dailies and just going, oh my God, she's so incredible. You know, and, and that was an instance of like, where do I not how do I not get in the way of her performance? How do I just let her performance happen without getting in the way? When I think of Man in the High Castle, it's such a high concept project in a sense that like, how do we do this so that feels real? Right. And, and the acting carries a lot. Like it does They're so incredible. Well. Yeah. So, so incredible. And Rufus Sewell, he's incredible. I mean, like they're just like, you know, they, they were the top notch for sure. What were some of the challenges in editing Man in the High Castle? Well, I got scenes in Japanese, so that was really hard. <laughs> like, <laughs> the one, it's like the one language. <laughs> that was <Yeah>. difficult. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, that I can't, you know, and I did actually, we did, we lived, um, we lived overseas. My husband and I lived overseas um, in Singapore and uh, we lived there for, he lived there for six years and I lived there for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and I would commute back and forth for work, but um we did spend a lot of time in Japan. And so I did take, I took like a year of Japanese to, because we, just to communicate, like I'm very basic at a very rudimentary level. Mm -hmm. It's such a difficult language. But when I was cutting those scenes, it actually came in, in handy. I could like understand like every fourth word or something like that. So it was like, it was pretty great, but that was definitely a challenge. And then there were just a lot of visual effects and you know, working with the visual effects, same thing with like Raised by Wolves, like there's a lot of visual effects and so you have to imagine what is happening because we don't have the animatic yet, we don't have a, a temp something in there. And so sometimes we, I'd have like the visual effects team just temp in like a ball or something. So I could time, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. instead of me just counting in my head, like one, two, three, two, two, okay. And then cut, like temp something in so I can see something moving just in the frame and then you know, and then the, the snake can come in or then the, you know, whatever the, you know, explosion can happen. Well, I have to say, I'm sure your, your one year of Japanese is probably better than my multiple year Canadian French. <laughs> 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 Did terrible in it. And, and I'm an embarrassment to, uh, you know, my nation. <laughs> so. That's so funny. That's how, you know, my husband's French. So we speak, oh, we speak French. I'd also love to do a project in French. Yeah. That'd be a dream too. More what, challenging than Spanish though. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, yeah, my wife speaks Spanish and she, it's, you know, whenever we've traveled to Spanish countries, I'm always like, what'd they say? <laughs> what'd they say? <laughs> like, like, just learn the language. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, now you, you talked about the VFX being a challenge. Um, one of the things that's always sort of stuck out with, for me with VFX would be trying to get your timing down in terms of pacing and rhythm. Right. So, right. you know, you mentioned one technique where you're putting in something Temp. How how do you get a sense of the pacing for a scene when half of it might be missing? It's really hard. It's really hard. And I mean, I just without without an animatic or without some sort of something in there, it's very difficult. So I will like I'll even put up like a title card mm -hmm. if I can't get like if visual effects is busy doing something else and I can't get someone to tempt something in, then I'll just put up a title card you know, that says like the letter X or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So that I can like space it out. And usually it takes, like it just takes multiple editing passes mm -hmm. on it, right? Because you can't, and it even, it even changes when the, the, when you get like a rough temp mm -hmm. in. I mean, what you try to do is, is not, you know, have to add length to it, right? Because then you have to re-deliver the shot and then you have to pull more frames and it becomes another cost and so it gets expensive. So I really try to almost slightly over cut it 
like over mm -hmm. make it slightly longer than I would so that we don't have to go through all of that expense so that if I have to turn frames here and there it's not an app it's not a huge issue okay. in the early stages when it gets closer then you can't you really have to stick to like the handles unless it's like you know a huge redo and then that's then that becomes you know another another yeah. animal now you know I've talked to different editors and uh, they all sort of, everyone sort of has a different way of how they like to approach the sound in the scene. Some, you know, don't want to bother with sound. They hand it to their assistants. Some are obsessed with making a full mini sound design. How mm -hmm. do you like to approach sound for your projects? I think it's kind of a hybrid that I do. So I definitely, I love sound. I think sound is, is key, uh, is really goes hand in hand, obviously with picture editing. So I love sound. I love when assistants can do sound. I do sound. I do. I mean, it's sort of like a mix of everything. It's kind of, you know, once the editing, once, so what I do is I'll, I'll you know, do the rough pass of the scene and then usually the assistant will look at it and then say, oh my God, this is terrible. No, but, um, and then I was like, yes, I know it needs to be, it needs, I, I can fix this. But, um, and then they'll sort of start pulling some sound effects, get some things, and I might say, oh, and what about this? And what about this? And we'll sort of have like a brainstorm back and forth. If it's a big like you know, scene that requires big sound design. And then I'll go back and I'll take a pass and then the scene will be working. And then depending on where we're at, like right now I'm working on something and I'm in a decent place. And so I will go through and do sound work with the assistant because I'm, I'm ahead of stuff and I feel like good with the picture and stuff. So it's like, I'm able to like, sometimes we're really under the gun. And so sometimes it has to be like, I'm still editing the picture while the assistant is like dropping in sound. But, um, but I love music and I love to like score and I love to tend music in. So that's one of my favorite things. I wish we had just like days dedicated to just that. Now, do you, do you rely on the sound? Like, do you go to the sound department and get sound effects ahead of For time? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends. Um, usually seasoned assistants have their own sound effects library and I have my own sound effects library. Mm -hmm. So if it's something specific, like for example, on Raised by Wolves, when we had the Necromancer scream, like our mm -hmm. sound department made that scream. So they actually, and they gave like several, I think they gave us like 10 options yeah. and then really chose an option that he liked and then we used that from then on and then if we had like their guns that they were using like we didn't quite have any guns that were special enough sounding because they were supposed to be different guns right so so we asked the sound department to give us you know gun shooting like in between like a laser and like an actual real gun so it you know so they made sound effects for us in that way too which was really cool now i have one last question that i ask uh everyone i'm interviewing We've been stuck in this pandemic for about a year and a half and yeah. on and off yeah. people are locked inside. Uh, and so a lot of people have been turning to the streaming services for shows and movies. Is there a show or movie that you've discovered over the last year that you think people should check out? Oh my gosh. I loved, loved, loved two French series, which if you have not seen, you should see. One of them is uh, Call My Agent. Okay. And the other one is um, The Bureau. No, I haven't seen those. And it's, you haven't seen those? No. Oh my God, you need to just hang up right now and go watch them. They're incredible. So Call My Agent is a French series. It's on Netflix yeah. and it's so funny. It's laugh out loud funny. And I feel like it really got us through just the tense times of the pandemic. It's so well done. And then the other one, The Bureau, it um, stars Matthew Kassavitz. He's a, a very famous French mm -hmm. actor. You'll recognize him. And he's incredible. The writing, the directing, the acting. It just is, it's like a five season thriller. And it's yeah. incredible. If you liked The Wire, that it's yeah. like, it's so well done. It's one of the best series I've ever seen. Interesting. Now, so. do you, in like a side question here, are you, do you, when you watch films or shows that you don't speak the language of, do you turn on the subtitles or do you prefer it when you have it dubbed? I turn on the subtitles for yeah. sure. For sure, for sure. I love to hear the original language. And there's so much behind the performance, the inflection, and plus the, it's not in sync when it's dubbed. So it's just yeah. really, I, I don't even know, do they even do dubbed anymore? Well, you know, the reason I was asking is in my, in my head, there's, um, because of the deep fakes that are coming, there's yeah. a company now that is 
trying to make it so that if you dub it, it alters the mouth and matches, so it won't be out of sync anymore. Uh, which is kind of creepy, but <laughs> how on earth are they doing that? That's incredible. It's, yeah, it's pretty amazing just to see that technology being used in that way. But it's also unsettling to think that you could change what people say. So or change their mouse. That's yeah. Wow. So. Okay. So yeah, no. So I definitely like subtitles. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview. Absolutely, uh, Gordon. Thank you. And uh, that's it for this week. Make sure to check out filmmakeru.com for our latest courses and follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. And a special thanks to OWC for sponsoring this episode. Check them out at owcdigital.com. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. And thanks very much for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. Take care. All right, you too.